Hi, this is Quinlan, and today I am down in Yamagata Prefecture, about a three-hour drive to the southwest of where I live in Morioka. I was invited down to Yamagata to help publicize a certain thing. Was it the Yamabushi, those mountain ascetic monks? No. I was actually brought down here to learn about something a little bit more elegant. Yamagata has a prefectural flower, and that is the safflower, or benibana in Japanese. From the end of the Muromachi period, about 500-ish years ago, through the Edo period, until about 100 years ago, this was a vitally important crop in this area. And these flowers, these little yellow flowers, were said to be worth 10 times their weight in gold. The safflower is actually one of the oldest crops in human history. When people first excavated the tomb of the Egyptian pharaoh Tutankhamun, they found fabrics that were dyed with these safflower. And according to most historians, it looks like while it originated around the area of Israel and Egypt, it followed the Silk Road and probably entered Japan as early as the third century. From mid-Edo, around the 16 and 1700s, these safflowers became vital in dyeing fabrics red. Red is actually a really important color in Japanese spiritual and sort of religious tradition. The Shinto priests at all of the shrines would wear red when they conducted rituals to ward off evil. Also, it was used as a lipstick in weddings and other special occasions. However, this natural red dye was really difficult to produce. Let's take a look at the safflower themselves. They're basically yellow thistles, or at least that's what they look like. They've got thorns near the top and a bright yellow flower. But if you look really carefully, there is about a tiny hint, 1% it said, roughly, of red in that yellow. And that red is this invaluable red dye that is used for all of these traditional fabrics and lipsticks. These thistles that needed to be hand-picked one by one and painstakingly processed to get that little hint of red out of that 99% yellow flower. It took 600,000 blossoms to get enough dye to dye a single kimono. And that's why they are so incredibly valuable, 10 times their weight in gold, as the saying goes. In the 16 and 1700s, huge areas of the Mogami River Basin here in Yamagata were cultivating this great cash crop, safflower. They would take them to the coast and load them onto boats, which would make their way west, eventually towards Kyoto, where the fabric dyers in Kyoto would use them on their fabrics, as well as on cosmetics. One interesting thing about the lipstick is that if you put one layer of lipstick on, it would be red, but it was fashionable in the Edo period to put multiple layers of this red, and something about the property of the flower and the lipstick, it would shimmer green on top of it. And this became all the rage, apparently, back 300 years ago, and it was expensive. As a result, some people would put coal on their lips first, a little bit of coal to turn it black, and then just one layer of red over it. And the red over that coal is said to have made it look kind of greenish, and so it was the poor person's way of uh, using the lipstick. During its heyday, more than half of all of the safflower blossoms were being produced in this area, the Mogami River Basin. A lot of farmers became wealthy through growing this cash crop, and that's where I am right now, in an area where there's some wealthy old farmhouses from this period. However, in the last period of the 19th century, Sichuan province in China started producing them and exporting them even more cheaply. Then in the 1880s and 90s, there was a chemical dye which made it economically unviable for them to grow and do this painstakingly long, difficult process using the flowers. So while the cultivation of safflower was all but wiped out, in the last few decades, local people wanted to bring back the practice. It was found that a number of farmers had, of course, saved seeds. And so a number of families started growing it again. They received government support. And now there is a steady growing movement to see all of the different ways in which this traditional agricultural heritage can be preserved and brought into the modern era. 
One example is a elementary school student suggested that they might use the yellow part because remember, the dye is just this 1% and so they don't use the yellow for that much. But she suggested that they could put it into some types of local sodas to color them yellow and they did it. And now you can have some drinks. There's actually a lot of yellow being used as natural food coloring. Why not? There are also three hands-on activities that they designed for us to participate in to learn about the various uses of the safflower. So let me just show you a little bit about these. Now I'm just outside of Yamagata City in the Miyama area at a little workshop where they use the dried safflower petals to make washi traditional Japanese paper. If you visit here, you're able to try a number of local crafts, including making this paper that's been done the same way for more than 400 years. To make this paper is actually a drawn out process that takes more than a week. They take a rather thin tree, they steam it, then peel off the bark. After they've separated the bark, they leave it hanging in the snow to be bleached by the sun and the snow and the wind and then they use the other parts of the tree just as kindling and firewood. So today we just got to test out a tiny bit of the most fun, interesting, interactive part of making this washi. Of course, the reason for putting the dried safflower or benibana in this is purely decorative because that is the reason why you make traditional Japanese paper these days, is for traditional wrapping paper or an important award, things like that. And so you want to make it as special as possible. So why not use an ingredient that's worth more than 10 times its weight in gold in your paper? This part of our mission is just to be doing some cooking using these safflower blossoms in the recipes. And so we've been given a recipe, some ingredients, and it's sort of like a mad race to figure out exactly what we're doing here. <laughs> Well, it looks like we've cooked everything up. We made noodles, we made onigiri rice balls. So this feast is mostly made with that safflower. The noodles are made with the greens from them. There is a dessert, a Japanese traditional dessert called kanten, which has the actual petals themselves as part of it. There is delicious local safflower as nearly every part of this meal that we just put together. So let's taste it and see how it is. That was a feast. Now, the last activity that they're showing us today about these safflowers is what the original purpose is. We're going to do some dyeing and see the traditional method in Yamagata using the safflower or benibana. We're basically doing a simple dyeing of a handkerchief. So basically we're gonna take the handkerchief, use a rubber band or chopsticks um, to tighten it up and then to create the patterns with it. Let's see what everybody does. I hope I've sparked your interest 
through watching these activities and learning about the history of safflower, one of the oldest cultivated crops in human history. I hope you're able to visit Yamagata for yourself and see the safflower fields with your own eyes. Maybe do some of these activities or something different or bring back some trace of this agricultural heritage that is still continuing here in North Japan. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you on the trails.